My name is Monk Rowe and we are in San Francisco filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm extremely pleased to have Eddie Marshall with me today, who's a drummer and composer and a recordist. We call mm -hmm. you a recordist. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's How a pleasure to have you here. Well, it's a pleasure to be invited here. Yeah. You were just talking uh, before we were rolling about San Francisco has a fairly healthy a very music scene. healthy music climate here. Um, very, I I feel very healthy jazz climate. It's not, you know, this isn't the jazz center of the world, but a lot of these young musicians who, some of them I had the pleasure of teaching, and they've gone off to like schools like um, the New School in New York and Berkeley School of Music, mm -hmm. and, um, a lot of the East Coast schools. They've come back to San Francisco, and. They're working all over the place, and they're very fine musicians. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like a jazz mecca; it's more like a world music mecca, if anything. Yeah. This this area. Yeah. When I look in the local newspapers, I see a lot of different kinds mm -hmm. of things happening. Have an Asian community here, obviously, yes. that adds its own flavor. Its own flavor to yeah to the jazz music. Uh, it, it it is it is quite amazing um, how these different people from different backgrounds and different ethnic persuasions and with their own musical history and how jazz music just fits in with all of these different musics. I just, I just got back from Spain about a month or so ago. I was in the Basque country and I hear this music and I uh, can't even pronounce the gentleman's name, but it was music, it was at Basque folk songs but played in the flavor like a like weather report or something like that, oh. and it was just amazing. And all over the world, it's like that. You go to you know West Africa is an example. Um, you know the harmonies. It's no more like the old um, all the African you know really simple chords and mm -hmm. they're just like full blown uh, modern contemporary uh, musicians playing their, uh, you know, a jazz version of their ethnic music <laughs> and just really killing it. You know, I, I mean, I'm sort of like um, a, a dismayed at, at the, um, the, f the uh, music, for the music, I can't even call it phenomenal, but the music trend that's going on now with the hip hop music. Uh, uh, and it's not to put down a music because I don't be believe there's any music there to put down. You know, and the, the concern I have is that these children, there's a generation of children in America, not just black kids, but children mm -hmm. in general, growing up without hearing a melody right. or a chord or even a lyric. They're hearing, um, you know, they're hearing beats, beat only. beats yeah. a very basic bass line, but nothing that musical. Yeah, and that really is worrisome to me because even in the days of rock and roll, when rock and roll was first introduced, um, you know, it was blues oriented. It had a melody. It, it had definite chords. You know, even, yeah. even if there were only three right. of them, right. <laughs> there, was, there was a structure. There, there was a structure, <laughs> and, and so that concerns me. And not that I don't appreciate the. Um, I know youth in America. You know, a lot of it is age too. You know, yeah. I, 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 you know, sometimes I sound like my dad. Yeah. Because I grew up, you know, living with a, you know, my family is very, very musical, and my dad plays, my mom played the piano, everybody played the piano, and he was into Teddy Wilson <laughs> and um, Art Tatum, Nat King Cole, which who I and I love too, but. I was into bebop music, you know, when I was a teenager. I loved bebop music, and I'll never forget that um, I was watching uh, my father. We went to a party, and he sat in, and he's playing at the tables, and, and I'm in the crowd, you know, and I'm hearing these guys say, man, he's really a good piano player, but, you know, that's that old-fashioned shit. I like bebop, you know, <laughs> and I've been talking about my, and I did too, you know, and sometimes <laughs> I think, like, some of the, um, 
the criticisms that we older people have of the kids' music is like maybe a little so sour olds or whatever. I think some you things know. never change. Because you know? <laughs> <laughs> I try to guard myself against that. Too. Right. They're like, you know, maybe. But the facts speak for themselves. I mean, I turn on the radio, and I'm telling you, I get more enjoyment out of listening to country western music and gospel music. Mm. The gospel music I hear on Sunday mornings, especially coming from the churches, some of the churches in L.A., I mean, they have these bands that, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire would have to really stay on their toes to wow. approach their music musicality. It's really true. It's just great singing. Great. And they're all kids from these schools, you know, these young kids. You know, a lot of the black kids go to um, the southern schools, you know, um, Morehouse and... Yeah. Uh, Oh, I forget that some of the schools, but and they're you know they're really trained musicians, and this really shows. But well, along along with sounding like your parents, I I kind of wonder too about we have a whole generation of kids who don't listen to music without a video image. Exactly, and that part bothers me a little yes. bit too. That's a, and not even and the images that they show, it's so frustrating. It's like flash this, it goes, tsh, tsh, you know, just shifts from one. It never settles on anything, and and, and you know, my conspiracy theory upbringing <laughs> <laughs> leads me to think that they're just zapping, you know, Nike's just subliminally zapping a message to these kids that they'll take a program and deprogram in their mm. later life or something, you know. <laughs> Well, you did come. Uh, music seems to be a, a family institution for you. Yeah. Your grandfather was a musician, is that right? Yeah. yeah. I, uh, well, my grandfather, now this is the point of uh, Kaiser Marshall. Yes. Well, you know, that's not, that's like a rumor. Is that right? Yeah. That's like, because like, I, I had, I, you know who first told me that was Art Blakey. Art Blakey used to come to, he used to, and I knew Art before. But he says, you know, yeah, he says, you got a yeah, your grandfather's kind of, you know, you got a grandfather named Kaiser Marshall. I said, well, I don't know, man, because the fact was that I never knew this. My mm -hmm. father's father, father. There was a big cloud of mystery around it. I see. You know, and then, <laughs> so, our play, so I don't know, that got out and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, sure People did. were telling me, like, your grandfather's Kaiser Marshall. I said, oh, and he invented the hi hat and he did all this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it's just like rumor. Is that right? But, and, and Art was like, well, well, he was pushing it himself. I, I never said, told too many people or anything. Like <laughs> Anyhow, um, when I did, I hired a, I hired a, I actually got my brother who lives in Massachusetts to get somebody to go back. Genealogist or one of them people, yeah. yeah. And it was, um, it was, you know, Kaiser was born like, uh, the dates just didn't add oh, up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But did you ever play with your father? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. I mean, that's how I started playing music. Uh-huh. I started playing in band. I always took piano lessons. I, you know, like, if you have a dad and a mom and aunts and see the guitar, piano, and uh -huh. back in those days, you know, you were like really country if you played a guitar. If you're a black kid playing a guitar, oh. forget it. I didn't want that image. I was too cool for that. <laughs> I didn't want to play the piano either, but there was nothing I could do, you know. So, like, from 10 to 14, that's what I did. I took piano lessons, and I really enjoyed this classical piano. Mm -hmm. And um, But my dad always had rehearsals at the house from the time I can remember. And, of course, when the drummer got off the drums, I would jump on there, you know. Even though I was six years old, then they'd throw me off. But I kept on... You know, I was just fascinated during the rehearsal. It never, I never even thought about it after rehearsal. But you know, while they were there, and I don't know if I was trying to get my dad's attention or anything. But by the time I was fourteen, I could actually play the beats that they played. It was like a dance band, mm -hmm. and they worked at the Westover Air Force Base and stuff like that, and wore suits and all that stuff. So there was one time, uh, the drummer, Tommy, Tommy Johnson, I believe his name was. He um, had trouble with his alimony payments, and they got a call. And the police were gonna come and get him. Anyhow, he split and left the drums there, and then my dad was stuck. 
so I said, hey, Dad, you know, I know all these songs. I was 14. I was still in junior high school. And he's, when it was at an Air Force base, and I'm with my dad. And so yeah. I'd start doing these gigs at the Air Force base with my music teacher from junior, because there was a, a young music teacher uh -huh. in the schools in Massachusetts during those days. In the 40s, you had, in the 50s, you had a music teacher. And this guy played the trumpet in my dad's band. So it was like a real secret that wow. that's 14 year old kids playing in the band. And that's how I started off and, you know, I, I kept my day job, I kept my paper route, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quit your day gig yet. I didn't know where yet. this was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> but when you say um, a dance band at, at that time, what would the repertoire have included? Okay, it would be like uh, all the standards. That's why I knew every standard in the world up until mm -hmm. the 1950s. <laughs> <I know. laughs> It would be like uh, Duke Ellington, Take the A Train, uh, Count Basie. It'd be like, uh, oh, I mean, every tune you could think of, the mm -hmm. music of the f 40s, basically. Okay. Any rhythm and blues yet? Well, that's what I did. Not in my dad's band. My uh -huh. dad was one of these bands that he made money because uh, he played like these yeah. offices, and then they do like weddings and stuff because we all had the suits on. And it was very. I only knew like four beats. <laughs> That's all you needed. Though. You needed a two beat and you <laughs> need a swing. And and you need a swing <laughs> and something Latin, which yeah. was always, it was just terrible. I never heard a Latin or seen a Latin band, you know, but I was heard it on the radio, whatever yes. they did. And so I did that. And then my uncle Cookie, who had a band called the Seven Sharps. This was when I was in high school. I was 16 then. And I played with his band at a club. My mom actually let me go to this mm -hmm. club called the Horseshoe in Springfield, Mass, and play drums with my uncle, with my uncle Cookie. Now this was an R and B band, oh. and this club, the Horseshoe, you have to realize everything was segregated back in those days. Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, and so the, all the black clubs were down on the south end, and. I worked there with my uncle that first night, and I was just totally gone. It was a fight. It was like everything. It was just like all this, all totally all black club, in one of those type of places where there's, it was just a hoot. You just could not believe it, you know. And so, and I, and the music was just killing, because it's R and B, and I really, really liked that. Yeah. Because you know, so I didn't. I never work. I didn't work for my dad anymore. <laughs> And it went from like we were making like I was making twenty dollars a night with my dad and eleven dollars a night with Cookie at the Horseshoe, but it was three nights in a row. Uh huh. And actually, it ended up by the time I left high school, four nights, and I did that for like two or three years. And of course, I never went to school on Friday. Uh huh. And I never went to school on Monday. <laughs> I was gonna say. And I had one of the lowest grade point averages ever. Uh, <laughs> recorded in the school history, <laughs> and, but uh, by that point I was just totally obsessed with music. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just, you know, just being in that environment and uh, playing dance music. I mean, yeah. that's what the whole thing. I, it was never. A, I never had a mentality of being like a drum star, even though my in those days my hero was Gene Krupa. Mm -hmm. you know, cause, uh, that's how I really started liking drums anyhow, you know, by going to the movies and seeing the old right. blues reels of Billy right. Goodman and Gene Krupa. And he just, I even got to take a lesson with him. No kidding. Yeah, it was like the highlight of my life. He was a nice man, wasn't oh, he? Oh, beautiful man. A beautiful guy. I felt so bad for him because he used to play at the Metropole. I don't know if you know about the Metropole. I've heard about it. It was, just, it it. was like, they had all these George Wetling, all these old... Yeah drummers who were like the baddest dudes in the world but it was like in the 50s and bebop ruled and they would play at the metropole in the front in the window like they were like mannequins oh and it, that's the part i didn't like and it, and it, like in the afternoon like gene would play there like sometimes five to eight and yeah. he's like you know and it's like i don't know it was didn't just very demeaning long bar a long stage behind the bar or something yeah 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 huh. it was it was i don't know Anyhow, uh, so I started playing with, you know, Cookie and the Seven Sharps, and Cookie's still alive. He's like 80-something years old, mm -hmm. and, and that was it. And I just stayed with that until I was 18, and then my, I had an uncle 
my uncle Roddy, who got drafted into the army. Actually, got drafted into the Marines during the K Korean War, which mm -hmm. was really, I think they drafted and gave him a choice or something. But he ended up a draftee in the Marines, mm -hmm. and he was a jazz fanatic. So when he left, he you know I was the only one he could leave his records with, you know, it, and they were all jazz records. It was Charlie Parker with strings. Um, I think it was Max Roach. No, it was Milestones. The old Milestones with you know with Miles and Sonny Rollins, and and there was another one, the Modern Jazz Quartet. So anyway, we left. Well, I heard Miles Davis, and that did it. That I was totally gone for jazz then. I couldn't play with Cookie anymore because <laughs> I kept on playing. You know, I was. Playing, you know, I remember the last few jobs I played with Cookie. I was so obsessed with bebop. I'm trying to play bebop in the rhythm and blues tunes, and they're looking at me, you know, because the groove would go. So I didn't, first of all, I didn't fit, and I didn't even know how to do it right. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. so, that That's was, so interesting that you got pulled from, you know, out of your father's mode into yeah. this thing, and then out of that thing. Yeah, Just no mind of my own. I saw that I was too big. He's so, totally susceptible to really wow. out uh -huh. stuff. Um, but I was. And then after that, then I was on a quest. I had to, you know, I knew I had to leave Springfield and mm -hmm. go to New York. I, I, you know, but on that same time as when Clifford Brown and Richie Powell died. And I had gotten tickets to go to... Um, it was the music well, in Lenox, Massachusetts, the music barn. They used to have these great festivals. And it, but it was way out in the boondocks. It's like, mm. you know, you had to take a bus and all that stuff. Anyhow, Max was playing there. And then I didn't know that Clifford had died. And, and you know, I got there. And um, instead of uh, Clifford, they had uh, Kenny Durham and Sonny Rollins. Which they were, which it was really Not bad. killing to a boil. <laughs> And I'll never forget, my bus left at 11.30, and it was 50 miles from Springfield. Now, I had to either leave in the middle of the set and mix, miss Matt, you know, miss the last yeah. part of it, or um, hitchhike in the dark home. And I hitchhiked in the Did dark really? home. I did. It was cold, so I'll never forget that. But it was totally worth it. You're paying your dues already. I did. You know, because <laughs> I'd heard Max on the records, you know, and I'm trying to do his stuff by just listening to it. And, of course, I had it all wrong. You know, after I got to see him, I could see oh. how he was really doing stuff. Like, ticka, ticka. you know, there was a way that Max hits each drum, and, and you couldn't tell it from uh, uh -huh. just listening like we did in those days. I did a lot of listening. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. And you finally got to New York and I got find to yourself York. in that scene? Oh, man, I went to New York. It was terrible. After being such a big cheese in Springfield, Mass., you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll never forget. I get off the... Well, actually, I went to New York first without my drums. I stayed with my aunt who lived in the, uh, Franklin Roosevelt apartments way on the Lower East Side. And... They had two kids, I'll never forget it. And they were just all over me. They thought they were going to have a big brother or something. I was 17, 18 years old. And so I couldn't do that. I left there. I, the fact is, I went to New York. I had $125. And I left that place. I went to the Y. I got a room at the Y. I got a job the next day because I had um, experience as a printer. Oh. As a, um, my own, I owned a printing shop. And I got a job, not as a printer, but as a messenger. One of those guys that runs messengers all over Manhattan, you know. So I had that, and I started taking lessons. But I didn't have any jobs or anything, and I was just totally um, threatened by every drummer I saw in New York, because they were all so good. Mm -hmm. I, never, I went to a club on 8th Avenue and right across the street from the, um, the bus station. And I um, heard this trio, and the drummer was so good. I mean, I said, oh, boy, I really got a lot to learn. It was just amazing. And I started taking lessons at Manhattan School of Music with Jim Chapin. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I started getting pretty good, but, you know, this totally, you know, New York was just another story <laughs> altogether. 
And I ended up going to a school called the Hartnett, Hartnett, school, of, Hartnett school of Music. It was a GI Bill school for, um, you know, get the kids getting out of the Korean War. They had a GI Bill and uh -huh. they were going to music. And it was on 42nd Street. And that's when I started meeting musicians and getting a little more into it. And I met Art Taylor. And he invited me to go to these sessions. He used to have these sessions in the East Village that, you know, after the gigs ended at three or four in the morning, and then he'd go to these sessions and play till seven. <laughs> 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 it, it, and I really didn't really do too much. We formed bands out of the school. And we worked. Yeah. We would do like get like a quartet together. Then we'd go out to um, Coney Island, especially during the summertime, and tell the guy, uh, you know, go into a club and say, look at, we'll, let's play here for the weekend. We'll pay, play one night for free and see how it goes. So we'd play like a Thursday or Friday night for free. Then on the weekends, we'd get paid. And maybe the gig would last like two or three weeks and then mm -hmm. we'd, you know, move on like that. And I was doing that and um, someone, I went back home to Springfield. And it was always, I, one thing I would remember, I, used to, I would go to all the clubs, I would, you know, Birdland, Basin Street, and uh, um, Half and they had a million clubs in New York. And um, there was one place called the Hickory House that I would walk by and I would see this Japanese woman playing the piano. Mm -hmm. And she was just like this gorgeous girl with this really, really, really long hair who could really play the piano. Because there was a, um, another, a couple other women that played, but it was sort of like cocktail stuff. And Jake Hanna was playing with her. And it was Toshiko. Toshiko. And so, you know, I would go there and listen sometimes, you know, and I was really sort of enthralled with her. She was really cute, you know. And, <laughs> and so, as everybody in New York was, but she's one of these things, it was one of these phenomena where she's yeah. a really cute woman, but boy, could she play. Boy. And anyhow, so anyhow, I'm in New York, and I heard, I was, no, I was back in Springfield, and I heard that Toshiko and Charlie Mariano, who was her husband, were looking for a drummer, and they, and they were playing in Hartford. Oh. So I drove down to Harvard, I told, you know, I used to see you all the time, and I was delivering stuff, I'd come by, you know, going to Birdland or something, and she was always very nice, and Charlie was just like a wonderful man, and... Anyhow, I auditioned for it and I got the job. Wow. And, you know, I've been working ever since yeah. then. <laughs> and with Toshiko every now and then. Yeah, I know. I have one of your <laughs> yeah, yeah. recordings here. You go to Japan every year with her? Or you know, not, it's almost every year. It's like yeah. for these last few years, I mean, since the economy's been so bad, we didn't yeah. go this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really. Um, did you play during your Army service? Yeah, play? I played a little bit. I played yeah. an army band, but I was, I was, uh, by the time I got, I got drafted into the army. And, yeah. And I was ha living in New York as a young man and having problems with drugs and mm -hmm. I sort of like, hit sort of like a rock bottom. And when I got drafted, you know, you know like all soldiers, I wanted to get out of, <laughs> you know, whatever, right. out of, out of, you couldn't get out of basic. I didn't know anything about anything that was going on in the world when I got drafted. This was like mm. in 62. I was just so totally involved with myself in music that I didn't know there was a war going on in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. or it, it just didn't, it was something I didn't really pay any much attention to politics and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and so I got in the army. I did get in the band. I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. But something was happening. There was a, something in the air. And like in 63, we started getting all of these... Um, Asian officers come into Fort Dix, and that meant every time they came in town, we had the, there was a concert band. You played in the jazz band. You have to. You were part of the concert band also. I mean, you didn't get any leaves. You were playing, uh, you know, whatever the national anthem was for these different officers. Oh. And so they're. I know now they were just building up for the war. You know, they have these people coming over here, and there's a fanfare, and then. The band, which was good, but we just played dance music. We were playing all these Woody Herman things, and it was like um, um, USO clubs, all you know, Philly and, and um, New York, and mostly Philly and New York. And I just 
I opted out. And so mm -hmm. I got, I told warrant officer Brown, I said, look, I got to get out of this. And uh, then they were going to have some of us march, too. That's what really did Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what really did it. And um, so I got out, and I went in the field artillery. No. Because I knew I would be out in the woods, and I love that. I, to this day, I love yeah. it. I, my kids, some of them hate me for the things I brought them through. I used to bring, they really? Go every going year camping, go camping and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and now the grandkids love it, though. Good. Um, well, really. you have some people to work with now. <laughs> <I know. laughs> But I did, I got, I went into that, and um, I stayed in the Army. Actually, the Army was good for me. Yeah. It really was. It, you know, it totally cleaned up my act. Mm -hmm. And I got out in 64 and 65. I joined Stan Getz Band and did that for a year. And, um, well, no, what did I do after that? Oh, yeah, and after that, I worked with Dionne Warwick. Uh-huh. I did that for almost two years. She was at uh, a very high period oh, of her career, boy. right? That was real, because then I was back in R&B again. Yeah. Which was really, uh, you know, I thought, oh, this and R&B, and I was making more than $11 a night. Yeah, <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, she was a sweetheart, I mean, boy, oh, boy. Was she ever a nice woman? Because I had my first wife, you know, she would sometimes, Dion would just take her along with us, you know, and we traveled all over the place. Mm -hmm. And great shows. You know, we do these shows with Stevie Wonder and Gladys Knight and the Pips and uh, Wilson Pickett, Ooh. Al Green, all of these really yeah. heavy soul acts, you know. And it, it was just, it was just wild and really nice people it's amazing because most of those people on those tours they're church people they were people oh. that you know so they travel with their moms and <laughs> yeah <laughs> Dion traveled with her mom half the time most of the time you know. neat it was you're it was getting back wholesome. in the other direction now oh <laughs> yeah and the thing it was though it was like you get into it so much and it's a whole different life everybody's like you know, you don't even set up your own drums. You don't do anything. You just no. get up there and you play. <laughs> and you're just playing the same songs all over and over and over mm -hmm. and over and over again. And so you get really good at playing those songs. But then when you try to play something else, you're like, really, it's foreign. You know, the, the movements aren't the same. You know, drums are very, it's, um, I do uh, this coordination. So one style of music demands a different set of coordination, mm -hmm. you know. It's, yeah, wow! It was really did, wild. did you stop doing that be, because it got repetitious, or was it just kind of? Canceled? Well, two reasons I stopped. Um, it was really good music. It'd be, I mean, Burt Backrack wrote beautiful songs for Dion. Mm -hmm. Anyone that had a heart and the great tune. I mean, really uh, music, rhythmically, everything. I loved playing that music. Then she recorded. Uh, Do you know the way to San Jose? Mm -hmm. So she was laughing about it. I didn't, I, I didn't do any recordings. We had a road band. And she brings this song to the rehearsal. She says, you, got, you guys are going to die after this. We recorded this. And you know, it was really doing great in some parts of the country. She's always talking like this. is doing this. And, and, and I said, Dion, <laughs> I said, that's the saddest. Sh I didn't tell her like that. Oh, yeah. But I told her, I said, you know, if this soon tune ever becomes a hit, I'm out of here. No kidding. I did. Because it was, the, the, you know, it was like, ding, ding, you know. yeah, it was like Ricky Ticky. <laughs> well, it becomes a hit and we're playing it every night. You know, they just, uh, and my wife was pregnant at the time and we were in L.A. And I said, you know, we couldn't go back. She's having a baby any minute. You know, so, well, you know, I'm, I'm quitting. So I quit in L.A. Mm -hmm. And we stayed out here. We had the baby. We were in L.A. And I just never went back to the East Coast. I mean, I go back and everything. But I just, yeah, it was just a different world. First, it was a lot of space. And I grew up back East. And, uh, you know, I felt really, I could really breathe out here. Mm -hmm. And I really liked the... Um, the temperament of the people. I thought that people were a lot more open in the West Coast mm -hmm. than they were here. So a lot of different things. And it was the 60s. So you know, like, um, it was. It was just like, 
pretty wild. I mean, we had the heavyweight black politics on one side. You had the hippies over here burning down Berkeley. <laughs> and yeah. this, all this different flow of music that was happening, you know, uh -huh. real strong Latino thing. I never knew any Latino people on the East Coast. You know, I just, not really. The circles you know. never mixed no, up there. No, I was just totally in a, in a bebop thing. And, and, and out here, you know, I met people, Asians playing jazz and, and playing their own music. You know, it's, it, just, it really opened my eyes. You know, mm -hmm. I just really, and plus, I could hike. I could get out. I could just drive 50 miles and be in the wilderness. That's neat. That, uh, that yeah. that's still one of the things that I uh, mm -hmm. can't wait to. Even when I go anywhere, I can't wait to get back here. Got little secret places I go. Yeah. Got my kayak. Oh no, <laughs> that's a great hobby. I got my grandsons who love the fish. What more could I ask for? Great. <laughs> and I got a new set of sonar drums. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you're in the pink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever have to do anything uh, for a living along the way oh, besides boy. playing drums? Oh, yes. Yes. But uh, let me tell you, like in, okay, my wife, my present wife of 21 years now, had two children when we met. I had three. It was all boys, five boys. So I'll never forget. So we could, and most of the time I was on the road. You know, that's how yeah. I made my money. So, as long as I was on the road all the time, I could do okay. Because uh -huh. I didn't have any really ridiculous habits. I just sent my money home, and it worked out all right. Okay, so, so anyhow, Sue's new to all of this, and she's got the five boys. Their ages are like at that time were like three to maybe like. 12. Whoa. All boys. So I live, I remember I went with Bobby, went to Europe. I come back. <laughs> Sue says, never again. This <laughs> yeah, was just crazy. Because you know? these five boys, they bonded like this. You know? Sometimes you hear like families get together uh -huh. and there's all this fighting between. Well, they were like, bam, like, and they still are. <laughs> but to the detriment of Sue, mainly, because they'll be the only woman there. One against know? five. Yeah. So. You know, there's, I couldn't leave. And there's no way I could make enough money in town. So I started my own handyman business. Uh -huh. It was construction business. I had a buddy who, um, Jesse Flurry, who was, like myself, very good with his, you know, with carpentry and stuff like that. And this friend of ours owns property in San Francisco. A lot of, you know, buildings and stuff. And they always need, somebody needs... Uh, door put on or somebody wants cabinets or somebody wants uh, there's a leak in the ceiling because of yeah. an apartment and somebody ran the tub over well but that's what we did mm -hmm. it was our own company we hired our boys you oh. know the older boys all worked with me uh -huh. and I did that for like five years you know till the you know the older ones got in college and then you know, it's just, it was a little easier. Started I, When I first moved out here, I was on the road so much, I didn't even know anybody in San Francisco, well, sure. hardly, you know? Sure. And so I did that, and, and to tell you the truth, we did pretty well, too. We made a lot of money. You know, the kids learned how to work. You know, yeah. so it's, yeah. you know they're musicians, too. My, like, three of my kids play music. And... and um, it's amazing because sometimes I'll go by a house or something where I built a fence. You know, sometimes I build fences, and I say, "That see that fence over? Yeah, Daddy, we, we know. know. We we know. Oh boy, here yeah. we go." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do they, they listen to your records? My old the, the boys do. Yeah, they yeah. listen to them, but they didn't ever play that type of music. Yeah. My kids were like, even my stepchildren, they were even was like totally into um, Mick Jagger and uh, um, Paul Butterfield and all mm. of, yeah. yeah. And my kids were like in the cameo and uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. Yeah. And, but they all play like guitars and bass and drums. So I always had a band in the house, you know. Uh -huh. I, in fact, when I had like an R&B gig, I would just hire them because they could 
play it better than any other jazz musicians. No kidding, believe sure. me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that can be funny sometimes, hearing straight jazz people trying to play some rock and roll. I know, because I, <laughs> I tried to play with their band. Just, they're all over me, and they, yeah. we had a little hip-hop band together. And none of them, you know, Al plays drums, my oldest, oldest son. And, but they wanted, he wanted to play key, but they play everything. But, so I played with them for a while, and I can do it for a while, you know what I mean? I can keep the pocket going on. But I got to always put something a little extra. So I'd be like... Then I go, and they, as soon as I did it, they turn around. You know, and I said, oh man, forget it then. You know. <laughs> but they were really, they still are good musicians. Those kids, they could play like, uh, before they um, heard Michael Jackson. This is a funny story too, because they well, before, before they heard Michael Jackson, the only thing they ever heard in my house was just jazz, mostly train and miles, you know, <laughs> and songs that I wrote. Uh -huh. So I'd have to, I bought those, I bought my kids like a Beatle bass, you know, Andre wanted to play the bass. Yeah. So he's like 11 years old, he could probably hardly even get his arm up there, but he just kept on doing it, he could, and he could actually play. And they were uncorrupted by um, time signatures. So if I wrote a song that was in 7-8, and I showed, I would say, Andre, just go like this. Boom, ba -do 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 he didn't count. He would just do it, <laughs> you know? yeah. and and <laughs> it would amaze my jazz friends because I would write those say, those tunes and ask them to play it, and they could not play it because they're counting. You know? Right, this is too odd. Yeah, it was this. Yeah, uh, well, they got pretty good, and the you know like the two that were really opposed were Al and Reven, the one that liked rock and roll, and the other one and Al who liked R and B. They auditioned for the same blues band when they were older. And they both get on the band. You know, it was amazing. Al, you know, and they traveled. And my kids are interracial kids, you know. My, mm -hmm. And um, they traveled with this black singer in the South. And Reven is my wife's son. And he's, he's white. I see. And Al looks like, um, like he's from... I don't know. Al, Al looks like either Spanish or Arab. <laughs> really, <laughs> you know, really uh -huh. tall. And so they're playing all these black clubs, and the girls are coming on to them, and they don't know what they are. And he tell, and they tell them they're brothers. Oh, y'all ain't brothers. <laughs> 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 yeah, we are. And they, they, was, they would tell me all their war stories. And yeah. It was just really cute. Well, well, during this was. What what year are you talking about now? This was like in eighty five. Okay. Until about yeah. ninety. Okay, because we kind of skipped over. Um, wanted to talk about the fourth way. Oh boy! Well, that's another reason I stayed on the West Coast so yeah. long. Because it actually, after um, you know, I came out here with Dion and everything, and I was in L.A. L.A. I couldn't really hang, because L.A. is more like a recording industry, mm -hmm. and I've always played, you know, live music. So we were going to leave L.A., actually, and go back to New York, you know, when the baby was, like, a few months old. But Mike Knock, who was the piano player with Dion, he had moved out to the West Coast. He had left Dion's band before I did. And... He went to the West Coast, came up to San Francisco and worked with John Handy. And all this was going, there was a West Coast scene going on, but I didn't know it. I'm, you know, I'm back, you know. And um, he says, well, you know, before you go back, you know, I'm going to start a band. Me and Michael White are going to start this band. Just come up and see if you want to deal with it. You can stay at Michael White's house, you know, you don't have to pay rent and stuff. So we drove up here and Michael White was living in Oakland. and we start, is it the fourth way? Well, it started to take, I started really enjoying living in San Francisco because I had never hadn't played any, you know, really like uh, rock and roll type music. Yeah. I played R&B, but this was more like rock and jazz. Yeah. And I remember I was still smoking cigarettes and I remember like the first week or so, because you're just playing really hard all the time. I'm going, you know, and I quit smoking. Yeah. I quit this 20 year smoking habit. Wow. Because I was just getting pooped. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And um, the band actually took off, and um, we played a lot of clubs here. 
and um, oh, the guy that Bill Bill Graham, he mm -hmm. he started it, that whole scene was starting, sure. and he sort of liked our band, and we got hired to play a lot of opening acts at the Fillmore. We'd open for um, oh, the, uh, Grateful Dead. We opened for. Uh, Miles one time, we opened for a whole lot of different bands, but the one that was most important, we opened for Santana, mm. and Santana really liked us, so he took us on a tour with him, and we, I mean, to, it went to Europe, the Montreal Jazz Festival with Santana, and I've always respected that guy since, you know, ever, because yeah. he's... He always gives like jazz players a break to make money, you know what I mean? Yeah. He knows that we ain't making anything. So yeah. <laughs> even to this day, you know, he's got he still does stuff like that. And that was very you know, so the band took off and that lasted like three or four years mm -hmm. and the, living in the Bay Area and I just sort of got used to living here. Then I'm working out of here every now and then and um then um the I still thought I might go back because you always get that feeling, you know, and you know because my family's back east and everything. Then the Keystone Club, op the Keystone mm -hmm. opened up, and so I'm working there. Me and James Leary, and basically it was the rhythm section from Bobby Hutchison's band. I was started working with Bobby around that time also, and we worked at the Keystone. We were like the house band, George Cables. Um, and um, oh, I forget the bass player's name already. Anyhow, yeah, we were like a house trio there, and there was no reason to leave there because mm -hmm. all the guys that I would be working for in New York, they were all coming here. They were all here. coming here. <laughs> <laughs> so James Leary was a bass player, and so um, that that lasted for five years. Mm. By that time, I was too old to go back to New York. <laughs> <laughs> You'd established yourself here. Yeah, I was here. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, a long list of people came through there. And oh. Any people stand out in your in your memory particularly? Oh, boy. I mean, some people stand out, you know, even if I'd never worked with them. But <coughs> Dexter Gordon was one of them. He was like, he really was bigger than life person. Uh -huh. Yeah. But a lot, a lot of great musicians. Uh, Art Farmer, that was a particularly nice evening with Art Farmer and, and Clifford Jordan, who was just a wonderful, they were both wonderful people, but what great players. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's so many different players. Boy. Was Dexter um, as... You <laughs> <laughs> He, uh, you know what? They, what uh, when I would go to Europe, me, you know, Bobby. I worked. I worked with Bobby Hutchison, yeah. like, mostly in the seventies, and we'd go to Europe a lot. And Dexter lived in Europe then, and he was the king of Europe. I am telling you, he would everywhere Dexter played, it'd be thousands of people, and he was just always real. And he's just so tall, and he was just so. Uh, striking uh -huh. and he would be very very polite and he would always if he's gonna play a song over the rainbow he'd say someday over the rainbow way up he'd, he'd say the first few lines of the song and then he'd start playing whatever it is especially if it was a ballad then yeah. he had this big tone and all yeah. of a sudden boom, and he he just would just knock you out. He was amazing. He was, was just like that. And I worked with him, you know, when he first came back, and he didn't have his regular bands. Mm -hmm. so, and we went to Canada and different places. And um, but so many, you know, there were just so many good musicians that everybody that came through there. Yeah. Boy. Well. Um I see one of my other favorite people on here, and that is uh, John Hendricks. Oh boy, yeah. Now John Hendricks is a true living genius. I worked with John at in um, Evolution of the Blues. I think that was in the seventies, also. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll never forget one episode with John. There was some kind of. Um, 
it was a f some kind of tension between the dancers and John and whatever. Anyhow, it ended up with I sort of sided with the dancers, and John, and, and we saw it, like, it was like a walkout. Oh. And it was walkout, and so or a strike or a you know musician dancer strike whatever like that, and so we said we weren't going to do the show until certain demands were met. John says, John said, oh, I'll do the show myself. So I said, oh, I got to see it. I go to see the show myself. John did Evolution of the Blues, um, just about solo, and killed it. It was just wonderful. <laughs> it really was. I mean, he is such a genius. And, it, and you know, I don't know, have you seen him, ever seen him on stage? There's something about his face. He has a perfect stage presence. It's, you know, and he's totally focused. I've, I've watched this man a lot of times. He is totally focused. And he just, and it just, this energy exudes from him. Even when, it, when he's scatting, he's probably the only scat singer that you can really understand most of the time, you know. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's knowledgeable. It's not just um, baloney sounds. He pays attention to the chord structure of these tunes. Mm -hmm. He just... Amazing, but his diction and his timing on everything, and and I mean he was like amazing person. I just yeah. I just can't very articulate, like, yeah, and, and spiritual, and a total and character. Yeah, you know he's a wild man. Usually maybe he's a little calmer these days, <laughs> but he is very excited. You know, excited and loves jazz. You, know, you can tell people that, that really love this music. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, they just exude it. Yeah, you know. But he, yeah, he's pretty amazing. Well, the the um, San Francisco community seems to have embraced you as a um, institution. Almost, oh yeah, you know? either that or I should be institutionalized. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean I, you know, it's like a mutual love affair. Yeah. You know, it's um, this is a situation where like I moved out here. With you know, I with no immediate you know ba no family here, and but I have a great family, you know, family musicians and friends that I've met here, and who really support me and, mm -hmm. and jazz music in general. You know, they really do. A lot of these club owners they make a strong effort to keep jazz in San Francisco. There's no real major jazz club in San Francisco. Oh, you know, there's no Keystone anymore. The major jazz club in this area is Yoshi's. Which is a very fine club. I mean, they they keep the banner waving by bringing acts from all over the world mm -hmm. into Yoshi's. But we don't have we have the our alternative, which is a pretty good alternative, is our year-round San Francisco Jazz Festival that Randall has, uh -huh. you know, which nobody gave a prayer to when it first. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this thing of jazz festival all year round and mm. a city of less than. Seven hundred thousand people. It was, but it's working. So That's cool. He's a busy person. <laughs> yeah. I see you've even been to uh, Beijing. I've to been to Beijing with my friend John Jang. Which is a perfect example of um, the openness I found here in the West Coast, like um, with the Asian Jazz Society and people who. Asians who sat there saying, hey, look at man, we've been playing this music since it began, too. There were jazz <laughs> bands in China in the 40s. Yes, you know? unbelievable. So this isn't like something that we're f that's foreign to them. We've been living with you maniacs for all these years, yeah. so <laughs> we are authentic jazz musicians. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so John is one of these guys, you know, he's like... What's young, his name now? John Jang. Jang? Jang, G-A-N-G. Okay. And he's he's goes between a love for his Chinese music and a love for Duke Ellington and modern jazz music and he plays with people like David Murray and all of these mm -hmm. you know and so we went to Beijing on some kind of uh, I don't know how we got us over there it was a ba some kind of basic Beijing jazz festival as uh, which was only attended by the very rich <laughs> yeah. Uh, like a one-time yeah. event, you know. There's a lot of those in different parts of the world where the um, aristocrats or the ruling people mm -hmm. 
they like jazz and they'll they have enough money to import it you know and it was a very interesting experience I really loved Beijing I'll tell you that I mean the people there were just wonderful boy oh boy a nation that understands the uh, meaning of a nice hug <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, and they do. They yeah. give you hugs, and the young kids are just really great. You know, huh. I really enjoyed it. Over there. And, and um, it was sort of, I went to Tiananmen Square, and there was sort of there was a big tension with the soldiers. The, the soldiers there, you know, like our soldiers here. At least you can say, "Hey, how you doing, buddy?" Mm. You know, their soldiers are really stiff and really rigid and you don't fool around with them at all you don't have conversation and but the people are uh, just very friendly want to know where you're from and da -da -da, you know and maybe like 50 yards away from the center of Tiananmen Square there's a McDonald's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the golden arches are everywhere yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so you're not totally away from home yeah Tell me about your um, composing, if you would. When did you well, start you know, writing? I, you know, I was always an encouraged to compose. I, I showed an interest in it with everybody I ever worked with. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, for most of my jazz life, you know, I've had to read music and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and play other people's compositions. And the first person who encouraged me to write music actually was Mike Knock, because I always played this recorder. I played a recorder. It was, a, it was an instrument I, instrument I was introduced to when I was 16. Mm -hmm. and, but I you know, play mostly bebop. And I would compose tunes. And Mike Knock, you know, like one of the tunes, he said, you know, you ought to write that down. And I started, that, that was like in the late 60s. And um, so I've been writing ever since then. And I've had some things recorded. Johnny Griffin recorded one of my tunes, mm -hmm. and uh, Bobby Hutchins recorded a, a few of them. And, and it's it's what I like to do when I'm not, you know, musically when I'm not playing. Does the does the um, does this, a tune usually start with the recorder? Sometimes it starts with. In the early days, it started with the recorder. Now, it starts a lot, mostly with chord progressions a mm -hmm. lot of the times. Um, I got into theory and harmony, yeah. you know, uh, with, with a lot of different musicians. I mean, first with my dad, you know, I, you know, I right. would want to know what he was doing. I was a piano player too for a while, mm -hmm. you know, I took piano lessons and stuff. And I've always messed around with the piano. And But voicings have always fascinated me. You know, I remember the, the first time someone showed me how to um, do alternate voices. It was, it was just like one, three, five, and you go three, five, one, or five, three, one. You know, yeah. let's just get. And that just led, you know, the, the voices. And then I started playing with Bobby Hutchison, who was like, actually, I would have to say he's my um, theory. Te he was my theory teacher, and still yeah. is, because he is just so knowledgeable and so always so willing to show me how. These chords move, and how the scale, how the scale goes with that, you know, and and stuff I would never learn if I went to school, you know. I mean, because he's pa he's always was patient, and I would go back and try this, and then write, you know. I still have a lot of stuff that I wrote twenty years ago, thirty years ago. Mm -hmm. right? I know I use a computer. <laughs> I'm computerized. Good. So and now I'm writing this piece. I'm trying to get. It Grants now. I still love to write jazz pieces, but now I'm writing on. Um, I got sort of interested in Baroque music in the last 20 years or so, and I'm writing this music for two tenor recorders, oboe, and cello. And it's going to be. A, I'm trying to get a grant to do this, and mm -hmm. it's going to be a suite. And and then on some of the pieces, I'm going to add like percussion and bass and piano. And I, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Wow. This is the first time I've done something like this. Sounds like an interesting combination. Yeah, it and it really sounds good. It's, so, it's different, and, and the venues I'm choosing to do it in, you know, like these in San Francisco, they have a lot of um, 
functions at churches, some of the old wooden churches. There's a church here in the city called Old First Church mm -hmm. where they do um, concerts with, with, with small ensembles and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, has the scene between musicians and uh, has the racial scene between musicians changed over the years or was it ever an issue at all? Oh, uh, it's always an issue. This is America. <laughs> <laughs> it's always an issue. Yeah. It's either um, it's either white musicians feel that the record companies are slamming them because they just want to record black musicians. That was uh -huh. a that was a thing a few years ago, and it was probably true too because the record companies. I mean, I I don't even know if I want to even go there. But <laughs> I, mean, I mean, because it's like the. Um, you know, it's like the push the the youth thing. We're pushing young musicians and mm -hmm. and then pushing all black musicians or all black. You know, wherever the money flow goes, that's where the record companies go. Not to say that there's not a lot of good music being recorded. Mm -hmm. You know, but a lot of it, you know, is it's. Um, but the ratio thing, you know, it's probably least. At least that you know we're musicians, jazz musicians. I think we're probably wise enough now to know that neither of us are making any money. You know uh, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that's that's like I don't even see where that ever comes in. I mean, I you know it's like some people ask me something. Oh, is it better playing? You like playing with white musicians better than you like playing with black musicians? I mean, it's it's you always get that. Uh. And it's like you know like. I like playing with anybody. You know, if somebody can't play, that's a different thing. Is, you don't have to be black or white, not to, you know, and be sad. Yeah. You know, said, now, you know, if you take take a thing of comfort now, now sometimes, you know, you, you might think, yeah, you know, well, he sounds good. He's playing with his all these black musicians, but those guys are probably all my old buddies that I've known forever. You know, mm -hmm. and we have this camera. There always is going to be this thing about. Um, like if all Jewish people get together, and you, you know, you're in this family, you're yeah, having a yeah. ball because you're enjoying yeah. each other, you're enjoying each other's Jewishness or whatever right. it is. It's not just and a musical it, issue, yeah. right? Because if it gets down to that level, I I don't have any greater pleasure than I do playing with my kids. Mm. It never gets that relaxed, playing with anybody. You know, it's because they're just, you know, we've just done it so often and so it's been so real and so, you know. You're your kids, and I'm, right. you know, so it's a different thing. Now, I played like last night. I played with this wonderful kid, Leonard Thompson. These kids, I mean, they're young. I couldn't be their grandfathers, actually. <laughs> 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 and this kid's I mean, he's like 25, 30 uh -huh. years old, something like that. Really a great player. And the same with John, who's an Asian kid. But the thing, you know, you can always tell when you're playing with any musician is the sound you can hear with that with a piano player the sound that he gets on the piano like most of these guys kids or well, most young musicians there might be a lot of flash and everything you know and there's a lot of young kids can do that but there's a sound that a jazz pianist emits and a feeling and I always have to when someone what is that sound exactly I said, well, anyone knows what that sound is on the piano. It's Hank Jones. <laughs> Everybody oh. knows that. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, if you can, somebody yes. is, I mean, Herbie Hancock even yeah. knows that. Because, you yeah. know, it's just that, that sound, you know, the feeling. Yeah. And, you know, with drums, I mean, there's some people, like, I say, like, it's Elvin. Uh -huh. To me, Elvin Jones, he's like, he's an old man, but... Oh my God, he's epitomizes like my era of drummers. You know, mm -hmm. not that these kids aren't playing. It's Billy, I don't know if you know some of these guys like Billy Kilston and uh, Billy Drummond and mm. um, Gregory Hutchison. These are all these young kids that are our demon drummers. Yeah, <laughs> and all of us, as soon as we listen to Elvin, we have to go. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and Max is another one. Uh huh. Still going. Max was at my house a couple of years ago. He was in town for doing a recording, so I invited him over to the house. And I had my drum set up in the living room, and, and he sits down to play, and I'm playing the piano, we're playing these blues and everything, and 
He's singing. <laughs> oh, gee. Yeah, like, he's, you know, he's, he's getting pretty f frail now, but he's still like, he's, so I leave, I didn't, you know, I, did, I left him there playing, you know, he's practicing on the drums and stuff, and I said, well, Max, I'm gonna, I have to step out for a minute, and so I just, actually, I just stepped out in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he's playing, and he's just playing, he's playing this stuff, it's like, like when I'm practicing, I'm always going ching 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 and doing something. He's going chicka chicka boom, go to boom, I got to do chicka chicka. And it's, he's playing all this stuff, and it's like a half hour he's playing. So I, I left. I didn't, you know, you know, because he's just into it. And I came back, and he was still playing an hour. And then I come back, and he says, "Oh man, these drums sound great." And I said, "Well, Max, why don't you come in?" sit in the backyard. I have a garden in the back, you know. So I bought him in the back in the sunshine and he laid back and he just fell dead asleep. <laughs> it was just so oh, nice wow. to have this guy that was my yeah. hero, you know. Did you tell him about the little thing? With no, I never told you him. You should that. Tell I him. really <laughs> did. You know, I hope I get this. I'll see him again. I yeah. do not. <laughs> Boy. Yeah, he's a marvelous person. Yeah. Some of those... Uh, there's people that you just, uh, we were talking about Earl Watkins, and they have a certain amount of class to them that yes. it rubs off on you. Yes. You know, like I always think of Milt Hinton and, and yes. guys like that. Who, yeah, I never got a chance to meet Milt Hinton. Yeah. But those are the kind of people that you feel better after you hang out with them. I am not. Bit, you know? I am not. Oh, boy. <laughs> Bobby Hutchison's another one. Hmm. Uh, Bobby and McCoy Tyner. I, I, they seem to, to be two of the greatest improvisers that I can, you know, if I think of something like the pure, pure improvising, mm -hmm. that, you know, and I'd have to add Herbie Hancock into that mm -hmm. too, that they can just take, um, you know, just bend harmony or whatever they do, everything is so pliable in their hands, you know. That I think I have a, a piece here that you played on with uh oh yeah we used to play this song a lot and this that's with Manny is Manny Boyd on this I think oh could be oh, yeah. from 77 oh yeah that's yeah that's Manny Boyd uh huh What, what kind of time are you used to being in the studio to get an album done? You know, in these days, when we used to do these albums, it would be like, first of all, we would get there and Bobby would have nothing to get. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd get there and, do, and rehearse the tunes. And maybe we'd do it like in two days at the uh -huh. most. Yeah. At the most. It's uh, you know, unbelievable that how fast we used to do those. But we were playing all the time, though. Yeah. So. I think Oren Keepnews produced some of this stuff, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. He sure did. Yeah. What's your view on the outlook for jazz these boy, days? Boy, oh boy. You know, I look at the percentages. I was, I was looking at one of these um, music trade magazines with jazz music actually comprises of maybe like less than 3% of yeah. the total sales. Um, so I don't see any financial gain coming out of it. <laughs> but on the other hand, the idea that it's, it, it is now worldwide is just totally fascinating to me. Yeah. That I can go anywhere in the world where there are young musicians who play jazz music and I don't even have to speak their language and we can play music together. Mm hmm and really play good music together yeah. too. That is, the, that's the, um, I think that's the, um, that's about all you can expect from jazz music. It's a great communicator. It's mm -hmm. not gonna be, it's, 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 it's a taste. You know, as much as we love it as musicians, it's a taste for the listener and, and it's an addiction for the musicians, you know? 
because yeah. there's there's no other I couldn't ever uh, take jazz music out of my life you know like the, my kids are always saying well, yeah I thought you said you were going to retire I said from what <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not work. Right? You know, this is not work. Right? I wake up every morning. I am just blessed. I'm, you know, sometimes I question, why did the spirit, great spirit, give me the privilege mm -hmm. of doing this? And everybody's working their balls off these days. Yeah. And you know, why am I the lucky one? And, some, and my brothers, you know, we're not especially nice people. We're not nice to anybody else. Uh -huh. Well, is it that, you know, that. Um, got us into this field of making music for people. Yeah. You know, and you, sometimes you get the sense people don't even want to hear music. But we still want to make it anyhow. I mean, right. what is that? That's the... Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I wonder, um, you know, in some sense, music is all over the place. And sometimes mm -hmm. I wonder if it's too much. Like, yeah. it's, it's in the grocery stores. Yeah. It's you can't avoid it when you're walking down the street because someone's mm -hmm. blaring it out of their car mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and after a while it becomes not as special yeah well you know one thing i don't the, the discrepancy about that is this place like brazil hmm. now you know because then i have to now i'm going to be guilty of saying good music and bad music because hmm. most of the time in the grocery stores and stuff you're hearing bad music and you're hearing I, I, I feel that, you okay. know, this is just my opinion. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you hear the elevator music, music with the drums etched out, or you yeah. know, somebody in a car, and you're not even hearing music, you hear something going boom, boom, and the car's jumping up and down. <laughs> Where in Brazil, you hear samba all the time. All the time. And you hear guitars. and But the guitars are playing the most beautiful changes, even if it's some kid just... You know, sitting in the in Sao Paulo somewhere with no legs and playing the guitar, he's playing these gorgeous changes and stuff. Mm. You know, he's not just going. Dun, 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 dun. And the, in Brazil, it is. It's infectious. You know, you talk about hearing it all the time. It's uh, the way of life. It's uh, the sound of the cities. The sound of Sao Paulo and and. Uh, and it's everywhere. I mean, it's just like you can hear the traffic, you can hear everything, but you hear that. <laughs> it's uh, totally amazing. I never forget that in, in Brazil, going to a um, one of these uh, favelas, and they have up in the hills, and they have the, they don't have like a um, bars and stuff. It's like a, you know, it's like somebody has this great big box or, or something and he's there and, the, and people just come up you know it's like street bar or something like that it's, just, it's not yeah. enclosed all oh. the way and but I was in one of those clubs and, they, and everybody's playing this they got maracas and tick, tick, and everybody jams and stuff and one guy had a matchbox one of those wooden, wooden max boxes with some of the matches taken out of it and, so he's, and he's going tick, 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 tick. but he was like a, a virtuoso he's going <laughs> And then he would take his fingers and and he's doing all this stuff with it. It's just and then they everybody give each other five and a bunch of other guys would come in and start doing it. Uh huh. It was like of course drinking. I had this drink that was amazing, Kasasha or something. It was like um, a lot of alcohol and a lot of sugar. <laughs> That's how I remember it. You would get stoned off this stuff. <laughs> Wow. But I mean, I saw that jazz music. I just see it now as, um, you know, it's it's always going to be an element in in American music. It's just, it's just so such a strong statement from the beginning, mm -hmm. you know. And but um, I see that jazz is salvation out of America. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's um, what do you call it? This intrusion the, into other people's music all over the world is the most exciting thing I feel yeah. that jazz is doing these days. It's a great export yeah. for this country. Yeah. Yeah. What's um, have any uh, interesting plans in the near future? Well, actually, I, I, I mean, I'll see another thing about this era, this area. You can always reinvent yourself. Now, I've been teaching 
a lot this last uh -huh. couple of years. So I haven't really been playing out at late, you know, nights. There's a couple of groups I play with. Um, one is the Bill Bell Trio. It's an Eddie Marshall Trio, and it's my job, and it's the Bill yeah. Bell. And, and that's sort of like a straight-ahead jazz trio. But um, I'm trying to put together an organ trio mm. with organ saxophone and, and drums. And that's probably going to be my next adventure and plus writing for this um ensemble yeah which i that's going to take a lot of my time uh-huh are you able to hear things back when you do the computer or the oh you know? boy i am hooked up i have no. every modern no gadget. kidding i uh, i you know the thing is when I, when I was in high school i went to a technical high school uh -huh. I took a technical course it was electronics and carpentry and all of this other stuff that's why i had my business and um so um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I I bought a computer maybe like 10 years ago. I have to swear I would never use a computer. Like 10 years ago, I bought a computer and I bought um, Performer, which is a sequencing program, mm -hmm. and Encore, which is a music writing program, and a lot of manuals. Yeah. And I sort of like mashed it off because I'm... No, I'm pretty clever at masters. So I have it now where I can play my music on the computer and it writes it out and and I have scores and it looks really neat, you know. And I'm always learning new programs. Great. So I am really I'm I am into the computer in that sense. And not that I'm uh, that I do music for presentation, but it's mm -hmm. my tool at this point. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, you've come a long way since you hitchhiked from Lennox Pass. <laughs> 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 That's a great story. Well, there's really something about music. It's, you know, music really allowed me to get out of Springfield mm -hmm. and get out of New York. Yeah. I mean, I was a, I mean, I was a kid. Sometimes I thought I would never get out of New York. Even though I loved it and everything, I th you know, it was so, it's so huge and so... Um, intimidating at some t at times. You know, it's like, uh, especially when I was living in Harlem. When you live in Harlem, it's uh, he's, though you love it and everything. He's, he's, you know, you know people yourself who've never gotten out of there. Hmm. You know, so it's sort of like, uh, damn, am I in this situation? I mean, I wasn't a rich college kid living in New York. I was <laughs> trying to struggle and make a living and learn how to play. Yeah. And you saw the kid gets like, whoa, man, this is maybe this is a little bit too big. <laughs> Did your parents um, think you were pursuing a dead end? Nah, no, it's quite the opposite. Really? Because like, the thing was, I never, I always made a buck, you know, and I was never a type of kid that was like, you know, if I wasn't making music, playing, making money playing music, I. Go out and get a job. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. It was, and so the my mom was like a real like Eddie Marshall fan. Oh, that's I nice. mean, this woman was just too much. I mean, I would come home even in the early day. I come home from practice, and I was really gone. Once I got into it, I mean, I was a maniac. I'd practice all the time, and she was just totally into it. And I'll never forget one night it was at, we were at Birdland. I forget who I was with. Well, with, probably with Toshiko. And we were opening for Buddy Rich's band. Mm. And so we're up there, and I played everything. And, played, and I said, Mom, we're going to sit and listen to Buddy Rich. So we watched, listen to Buddy Rich, and he's killing it. I mean, Buddy, you know, Buddy <laughs> yeah. Rich is just too much. So I said, and I know him, you know. So I said, I want you, I want to introduce you to him. And he was always nice to me. So I go out and say, and I said, but I'll let you meet my mom. It's the first thing she says, well, did you hear Eddie play? <laughs> and he's like taking off guard and everything. It's, wasn't that a wonderful solo? And I'm saying, Mom, please, you know, chill. You know, I was a little <laughs> embarrassed. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> well, she was like that, you know. Yeah. And she even like, and I have a brother 20 years younger than me, um, Ricky, and he's a drummer also. Uh -huh. And he started playing. And she was the same way with Ricky. Oh, good. You know, it's like, uh, no, they always, because they know, uh, I mean, I loved it a lot, and I wasn't going to do anything else anyhow, so. Right. 
Yeah. Well, it's nice to have that on your side. Oh, <laughs> well, I guess because I see so many guys that their parents are just like t were totally against it. Uh huh. This is a bad idea, and I said, like, boy. But I mean, I was sort of like show. I mean, I started playing professionally when I was fourteen, but it was always with relatives. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to get home. Like even when yeah. I worked with Cookie, you know, I had the we used to call the boss of the street, Mr. Griffin, who was like. He was like in the black mafia or something, you know, oh. numbers writers and all these kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he made sure I got home every night. Every mm -hmm. night, it was funny. I remember one, one time, he, wait, what's, on the weekends, he let me stop at the soul food restaurant. I said, Mr. Griffin, can we stop? I remember one night we stopped at the soul food restaurant on Worthington Street and was sitting there eating. And Mr. Griffin was this great big guy. He's like 6'2 and big, big guy, big rough guy. and. We're sitting there in the restaurant, and some guy comes in and he's ordering his food. And then there's a big fight, and MF this, and MF this. I'll be back, motherfucker, and all this shit like that. The guy goes, and we're getting ready to leave ourselves. He goes, and he comes back with a rifle. It, well, you should have seen every, even Mr. Griffin. Mr. Griffin grabs me, and, we, and he pulls me down under the table and everything. Hmm. And these guys are, well, you know, he's just arguing back, and you don't know if this guy's going to shoot the guy or not. And somebody snuck up in back of the guy and grabbed the rifle. And then we just got out of there. But it was so fast. It was Mr. Girl, he was under the table before I was. <laughs> <laughs> knows how to take care of himself, oh, I guess. Oh, man. Well, wow. well, this has really been a great pleasure talking <laughs> oh, to you. Thank you. you know, so. It's great um, going over my fabulous life. <laughs> <laughs> You've had one. Oh boy. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Well, thank and, you. Yeah, and I hope thank I get to hear you play sometime soon. Know.